Welcome to Falmouth Community Television, where you get the best in local programming for civic, educational, and government affairs. Today, uh, we're going to be covering our, our state senate. So I'm Jay Zavala, your host, and as usual, to add a little bit of texture and a lot of clarity to what's going on in Beacon Hill, we have Senator DiMacito. As you all remember, the good senator uh, has, covers Barnstable and um, Cape Cod. Vinny, good to see you. Jay, thanks for having well, me again. It's, a great, it's great to be on your show. Good. So a lot of things have happened since the last time uh, we met. In fact, I was looking at my calendar, and it was a good year, year apart. Ordinarily, we do a quarterly, but we both have been tied up with a lot of interesting activity. Just, just to start off our conversation and to give your constituents an opportunity to say, here's a question that Jay didn't ask but might be on their mind. How does we open up with just a general overview of what's been going on in the Senate over the past year, and then we'll go into some specific discussion? A lot of stuff has revolved around this, the finances of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, last year was a really challenging year because we did a budget, and as the budget was progressing, we started to realize the revenue started dropping. Uh, so much so that during the conference committee, which I have the privilege of serving on, that's when there's three members of the House and three members of the Senate that negotiate the, the, the two different branches of uh, the House and the Senate's budget, we had to cut some $700 million out of that agreed $40 billion budget. We had to cut $700 million out. So in doing that, um, you know, that it's very controversial. It's tough. You know, the finances there. And then once the budget was finally given to the governor, the governor still then cut another three, uh, three over and above. Over and over and above. Um, so there's you know some issues there. However, they agreed to a consensus revenue number. The governor believes that we're not going to have the money, and his concern is this: that if we don't have the revenue coming in, that he is constitutionally obligated, uh, what they call nine C cuts, to cut to meet what the revenue projections are. And what does the 9C correlate to? The 9C is, is, is a part of our Constitution. Is, yes, Section 9C, which says that a governor has a constitutional obligation to cut so they have a balanced budget. Gotcha. So his concern is this, that if you go into October, November, and the revenue is not meeting expectations, he then has to cut. And the reason this is important is because, let's say we were going to cut 3% out of an agency. Well, if you don't cut 3%, if, if you're going to cut 3%, but you wait till halfway through the year, that's the equivalent of a 6% cut because they've been operating at a, you know, a revenue expect, a expectation of revenue here, and then you have to cut in halfway through the year. So the, the number's larger. So to that extent, he, we've had to do that twice already. So in the, our, the last two um, calendar years, the governors had to do what they call 9C cuts halfway through the year, one for like $90 million, another one for $160 million. And um, our revenues aren't meeting projection. Even though the economy seems <coughs> pretty robust and things are moving, um, revenue has not been meeting projections. And so that's what the kind of the backdrop is. So right now we're dealing with the override. So there's a lot of things that we as legislators um, feel are important and some things obviously I agree with the governor on. Um, that we're not overriding because of the financial health of the Commonwealth. So um, w the biggest issue, as I say, if we're dealing with anything, it's, it's that. But there are a whole host of other issues that are still to come up. Uh, today we're going to be addressing uh, a supplemental budget to address some of the shortfalls in snow and ice and uh, CPCS, which is the uh, 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 assistance to individuals uh, who don't have the resources to get legal services. And that's revenue that we, you know, you have to spend, and then you, but you don't know till afterwards, so you're paying that. So this will finalize the budget, the, the last budget, the FY17 budget. So we're dealing with that. So that's that's kind of a big uh, con conversation piece for this day. So of the 320 million dollars that the governor cut, the House has re restored some 200 and. Or two hundred. Let's see, three hundred twenty million from the governor, two hundred and eighty-five from the House and Senate, right? Yes, and, and, and that's restored it. Restored back into right. The so the House has done the two hundred and eighty. The Senate has been actually slower. Uh, we've we've done some twenty-four million. We're doing you know not as many. I, I think 
Um, the reason that is is because there's still a wait and see. The month of August, we were about $11 million down under the new consensus revenue, uh, or what they call a benchmark. L September ended up being a little bit better month. We were up $120, more, $120 million. Then again, September is one of the largest months revenue-wise mm -hmm. coming in. So I think what the Senate's trying to do is get a better feel because they're concerned, in, in fact, about the revenue. The House feels more optimistic. They think the revenue is going to be there. I think the Senate is a little bit more concerned about the fact that are the revenues going to be there so we don't have to entertain uh, that exercise of nine C's. And furthermore, I think the biggest issue that concerns me is our rainy day fund. I'll give you a little context. In 2007, we had close to $2.5 billion in our rainy day fund. At that time, we had $25 million, uh, 20, a $25 billion budget, so 10% in a rainy day fund. Today, we have a $40 billion budget, yet we only have $1.3 billion in our rainy day fund. So the concern, not just for us to be able to do it, but we have bondholders, and the bondholders are concerned that if, in fact, we ever have a downturn again in our economy, are we going to have the ability as a commonwealth to continue to pay the bills? And that's something that I think has been wisdom back in the day when we had the, the substantial rainy day fund. And I believe the governor wants to build that rainy day fund back up, as I think you know, a, a lot of us do. But there's always pressure, as you know, in any type of a budgeting thing that people want something right away. Uh, my suggestion as a business owner is keep the rainy day fund, build the rainy day fund, be prepared for a rainy day, because I'm convinced it always rains. So of the 351 towns and cities in, our, in the Commonwealth, uh, the general health of the municipalities, what is that like from, from your view in the Senate? Uh, you know, the municipalities have struggled, you know, because of health care costs continue to rise, which has been a, a significant burden. Uh, education is, is also, you know, very expensive, and they're trying to keep up. Um, most school budgets are 70 to 75 percent are just labor-related, and, you know, you take the labor and the health care costs, it really eats up most of the school budgets. So... Um, there, you know, from my experience, com you know, communities are continue to struggle, and you know, the only place they get revenue uh, is obviously from the state, correct, and of course through property taxes. Sure, and that's a very stagnant. There's not a lot of fluctuation in that. They they know what they're going to take. They don't have a lot of room. Um, you know, you don't have the big months, you know, in the low months. It's very stable. The only thing that they need is stability is in state revenue. And we've worked hard up on Beacon Hill to make sure that the communities know what they're going to be getting and that it doesn't change halfway through the year. Even when the downturn happens, we don't go after local aid because we know the communities have no other way, nowhere else to go. And that's where I was leading with my question. If, if the local aid is there... The $320 million cut came primarily from organizations and nonprofits and social service programs? I, the, across the breadth and scope of government. What the, what the, what the governor did is, and, and it's any exercise, you take a budget that is, um, you know, literally the, it's this thick in regards to how big, and they, they're all line items. And in those line items are all these different agencies. And he uh, tried to cut a little bit everywhere to lessen the burden so that one group didn't take a big cut or the other group didn't take a big cut. He did a little bit out of everything. And, of course, now what you're seeing is the, this, uh, they're overriding you know, the House a little bit more in this line item, a little bit more go going back and restoring that. Um, and I, I get it because some of these individual things are things that we're really passionate about sure. and we believe in. However, I... I don't envy the governor's position because at the end of the day, in this case, Governor Baker has the responsibility of balancing the budget, and he's constitutionally obligated to do that. So we have the general court giveth and the governor taketh away. <laughs> exactly. right? Excellent. And, and, in that, and in that context, are there constituents that, that petition you and other le legislatures, legislators to put back revenues that may be slipping away. Of course they do, and, and you know what, and you understand that, because, you know, uh, most of these programs, they're doing good things. You know, we don't do programs just to do programs. We do them because they are doing good things. And when you take them individually, they all make sense. 
but I, but at least for me, you know, I've spent my career on the Committee on Ways and Means, which deals with the budgeting. And I understand the broader aspect of it. I understand the rainy day fund. I understand the, the debt burden that we have as a commonwealth. I look at all of these things, and I have to look at it in a totality. And as a business owner, that's how I've operated my business. I think I've been successful because I've done that. And so if you take the individual thing, it looks like you're being mean. But the reality is, is when you have a broader a broader context to be make sure that we're in phys good fiscal health as a commonwealth, um, it's, you know, it, it makes more sense when you right. do that. And that's, and that's what the governor's doing. I think that's why the governor's still so popular. Despite the fact he's required to make all these individual cuts, he's also been very transparent and open, and, uh, and people like him. He's the most popular governor in the, in the country right now, right now. Interesting. So... Let's tie another link into this structure that okay. we've been discussing. On top of or adjoining this, your role in the uh, legislature with regards to the budget, ways and means, you're now co-chairing a new committee, the Committee on Retail, right? Let's he, talk about that yes. and, and how it... Uh, dovetails with the other. So, so this is a special committee, uh, special subcommittee that was created by the Senate and uh, it's co-chaired by myself and uh, Senator Rodrigues from Westport. We were both you know, uh, small business owners in retail, so they thought we might have some experience to speak to this. And uh, it's a, uh, there are people from labor and retail from, you know, from across the Commonwealth, and we're going to go around and have conversations. Matter of fact, Julian Sear, the senator uh, from the Cape and Islands, is on this subcommittee as well. Uh, and we're going to go around the Commonwealth, not everywhere, but we're going to Cape Cod, which is very, you know, which has a very large retail sector. We're very reliant on retail on Cape Cod. We're going to go to Western Massachusetts, have a conversation in Western Massachusetts in how they're addressing the changing world of retail. As you see, Benny's just closed down. Macy's is closing buildings all the time. Best, you know, Best Buy is closing businesses. The bricks and mortar are really being hurt. And we're trying to find out, okay, uh, retail has been significantly affected. One in five jobs in the Commonwealth comes from retail. What can we do as a Commonwealth, as a legislature, if anything, to be able to help this industry continue to survive in the changing world of the Internet and Amazon now being the place where people get most of their goods? That's what has changed dramatically, and how do we continue to make sure that these brick and mortar facilities survive? How do we keep downtown Falmouth and downtown Barnstable and you know and, and all these little downtown communities still vibrant? Right. So that's got to be more than fitness centers and gymnasiums. Correct, right. and, and and it's you know in some places what is the model? It was funny back in the day. It was the downtowns; they were vibrant, and then the malls came in, and the malls. Put them out of business. Now you're seeing the uh, the internet and Amazon putting the malls out of business. It's um, so it's it's a change. Uh, to me, how do we turn that around? How do we address these empty malls? What can we do with the empty malls? Um, with the downtowns, how do we re revitalize the downtowns? Because those are still the hearts of our communities. Downtowns, uh, they were set up, there was retail, there was residential, uh, there was a place for people to congregate. How do we uh, re-energize them and what can we do as a commonwealth? So I'm really kind of excited about this because we all see it happening, but no one's talking about what we can do. So we're working out. We're going we're gonna to meet with some people who have studied this um, rather extensively. We're going to go to different communities, hear, uh, hear their perspective. And I think that hopefully that will inform us to do some things that we can do legislatively. Um, and, of course, but technology's changed. And sure. technology's changed, and we have to change with the technology. So in our lifetime, we've seen it move, the economy move from Main Street to malls, to the internet, mm -hmm. and it continues in that trend. Now, what do we do looking over our shoulder to bring back those, those centers of commerce, such as the malls, and find new and better uses for them without hurting Main Street in the process? Correct. And, 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 and as, you, as, you, as you know, businesses feed off of businesses. So it's not just, like not everyone can do um, you know, can go and get everything they want online. But the fact that there are other businesses around helps feed everybody else. So we're not just 
helping that business that's getting hurt by the Amazon. We're helping all the businesses. And that's the conversation. As you said, it, it's a huge task, but it has to be talked about. And that's what we're doing. And I'm, I, I appreciate the Senate president and the minority leader putting this task force together. And of course, the honor of being, you know, decided to being the co-chair of it. So what are, we, what are we going to see here on the Cape in terms of uh, scheduled meetings with the business sector? I can tell you uh, January 8th, we are going to be on Cape Cod. Uh, we, we've already set these dates up. We're on Cape Cod. We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really want to hear from you. We want to hear from You can people. come to my house. Yeah, exactly. Bring the group <laughs> we'll set in. it up. Yeah. And, um, but we want retailers to come to us and talk to us about what they think we should be doing. What, how, you know, what, what's their perspective? This is a blank slate. You know, I, we have no preconceived opinions on this. We just want to know what can we do legislatively to help, if anything, and I, and I don't have that answer to it, but clearly it's changing. Right. We know it's changing, and you can just see it by company after company going out of business. Well, we have a, a large constituency here in the business sector, and, and of course, the Cape Cod Commission plays a, an important role. The chambers of each, each town play an important role, uh, and, and the business leaders, but they're the same faces we see at most gatherings. It would be an interesting approach to see your office reach out, pass through them to the local guy on the main street and bring him in and uh, listen to his voice. And, and you know that's an excellent point uh, because we, the, the people that are in the chambers and whatnot tend to be more politically active and they, 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 they understand it more. We are trying to. As a matter of fact, on this commission, we have people that are just downtown Main Street shops. We have a, an ice cream shop from uh, Northampton, Massachusetts that's on this commission who you know, says, we need help. And, and again, the ice cream shop, you can't buy ice cream on the Internet. But what, you can't, what, what is happening to them is because downtown Main Street is starting to dry up, they're starting to feel it. They only make money in the in the summertime, correct? Sure. And so you these call an ice cream shop on Cape Cod in the summer big business. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so that's you know that's where you know we're 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 trying to broaden that scope and 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 then they, how do you define retail? There's all sure. kinds of different retail, um, but it's a it's a process and I and I and I think it's a good conversation to have. I'm glad you're in that position. Yeah, I really. It's am. good for us. Yeah. Well, I, so thank you. let's let's move away from business in general and drill down to the individual. The last time we met, we had an interesting conversation about opioids and what was going on in the Commonwealth to address this issue. As you know, it's expanded, gotten bigger. Now it's on a national scale. Thousands of people are dying and so forth. And now there's a new conversation, cannabis. So we're OK with the medicinal aspects of cannabis. But now we're talking about the recreational component. And as you know, here in Falmouth, uh, we're having a special meeting during uh, the annual, before the annual meeting to talk about recreational uh, marijuana and cannabis and how we're going to approach that and, and see where we are. Uh, give us the bigger picture. What do you see from the Commonwealth as well as your districts of Barnstable and Plymouth? So as, as far as the, the region, yes, this is a change. And opiates, a huge crisis. We did an omnibus bill. By all accounts, Massachusetts has the most progressive law in regards to addressing the opiate crisis. As a matter of fact, we have seen in the first year a 15% reduction in prescription, in the prescribing Bravo. of, uh, yeah, which is, we're making, you know, we're, we're making progress. We're, I believe we are starting to bend the curve. We still have a huge crisis. But, you know, we're, we're, we're approaching this, what I call, you know, or what the governor calls, opiates 2.0. Okay, we, we led, we led the, 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 the country, but now where do we go? We, there's more to be done. We have to do a better job. So now what you're seeing is all of these teaching hospitals, they're actually, which was never the case, actually teaching people about what they do, and these are uh, health care providers, in reference to prescribing and, and what questions you should be asking and doing different things that we've never seen before but there we're being much more cautious about how we um, prescribe and to, to that point five percent of the world's population in America 80 percent of the world's painkillers there's 
there lies some concern. So we have to do a better job. So we're addressing that. But now what else can we do? Where, where, where else can we go um, to, address, um, to address this, you know, uh, this crisis? And so we're trying to be creative and do different things. So, uh, you know, police departments are far more involved now than they ever were to, from that extent. Now, you talked about cannabis and what's happening with cannabis. Well, of course, as you know, uh, since we last spoke, it is now legal um, totally to, to, to have uh, cannabis shops and they are recreational facilities going up. Communities around the Commonwealth uh, have said, oh, wait a second, we're not sure. They've done moratoriums and or total bans. That's kind of happening. I think 100 communities have done either bans or moratoriums. Ble you know, right here in Falmouth, they've, they had done a ban and now there's going to be another conversation in regards to that uh, coming up, as you said. Um, I am of the belief go slow. And the reason I say that is I was in Colorado and I spent, you know, went with a special subcommittee that I was on addressing the whole issue and what happens if it becomes legal? What are the things that we need to watch out for? And the administration at that said is get baseline information. Know where you're at now so that when this happens, if it happens, you need to know what the effects are. How does it affect the schools? How does it affect the emergency rooms? And uh, how does it affect uh, driving under the influence? All of these things will help you, um, you know, make better decisions. So from my perspective, I applaud the town of Falmouth that they put a, a hold on and, uh, you know, had done a ban because I believe seeing how this thing plays out over the next year and a half, two years, we still don't even know. It's not till July of 2018 that these stores open up. A year from now or two years from then, you'll have a better perspective of how it's affected society and how it's, you know, affected the community. And really, you you need five years to really start getting an understanding. But going slow puts you in the driver's seat instead of the industry. It's a very, uh, very uh, affluent industry and, you know, money a lot of times talks. I'm very pleased to be a Falmouth resident. What I like about our leadership is that it wants to be first in some matters and it does not want to be first in all. Yes. And this is an example of our community through our leaders taking a very serious slow step in any direction of wait and see. Mm -hmm. So one of those oh yeah, mo oh yeah moments occurred recently when uh, Nantucket and the islands were talking about how do they transport uh, their, their agricultural product cannabis across. What are the rules of going across federal waters? Yeah. So. Those are the kinds of questions that we scratch our head and say, oh, yeah, we didn't think about that. And Falmouth wants to make certain that we've thought about all of those ramifications and make certain that we're not hurting our constituency. We, it all distills down to the, the basic fundamental of government, do no harm and protect your constituency. You know, and that's and you just talk about Falmouth, how they really are. They've been the leader in clean water. They, you know, they, they ahead of the curve in addressing that issue uh, and contamination and wastewater. Uh, the, you know, they've been a leader. The bike path. We talk about the bike path. I mean, it was one of the first. You know, the Shining Sea bike path. It was one of the first, and and the ex expansion of it and how it's really affected the quality of life and the recreation here. And you know, they've been the first. And as you said, and yet to have that wisdom to say, wait a second, let's look and see, because we've seen other issues. And you've had, you had the, um, the superintendent of schools here yep. have a long conversation with the superintendent of schools in Denver to have a conversation about what's happening in the schools. What do we need to do to be prepared for that? You know, the, the board of selectmen are trying to find out what's happening in other communities and other uh, so that they can make an informed decision. So that's wisdom in politics. You, you really have to, you, you have to be progressive. You have to be, you know, ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. But it's also wisdom to take a wait and see approach. And that is exactly what the governor of Colorado said. If I were you, I would sit back and wait because we're, this is the hardest thing he's ever dealt with. And, you know, wisdom would suggest, see how this plays out three, four, five years from now before you get in. And so uh, I, I applaud the town of Falmouth in doing that. You, you touched on the, um, the bikeway, the rail, the rail trail. Let's go back to that because that is a local issue. Uh, and uh, across municipal lines, we know that Bourne is very, um, constituents in Bourne 
are very much interested in a particular approach to uh, expanding the bike path and bike transportation across Cape Cod. And we also know that we have other constituents that are equally concerned and interested in uh, what, we, what we maintain, what we may lose, and what we want for all of us. So we have an interest in expanding the bike path. We have an interest in keeping the rail. We have an interest in having both, and we have interest in wanting only one or, or the other. So your thoughts on that subject as well. I, first of all, it's, I love the concept of wanting to expand it because it is, it's become unique to this region that you know, having the access to these bike paths, it's phenomenal. People, you know, people actually come here specifically to be able to take you know, this, this long seven point mi miles of, of bike path and now to think to expand it into Bourne and possibly go all the way down to Cape Cod, tying it all together. That's, you know, that's a pretty impressive thing and I think it's gonna be a huge calling card 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, that being said, you also have, and the way to do that is, you know, you have these rail beds. These rail beds are um, important in many ways, and, uh, you know, they're not being used now, but they could, you know, a lot of them aren't being used, and so they, people want to get rid of them and just put the bike path in. My suggestion would be to do both, is to keep the rail trail, I mean, keep the, the rail beds in and put the, the bike path aside it, and that way you can keep the recreational, expand the recreational access, but have access to uh, the, the rail because you don't know what the need is. And if we were ever to, and what happens 10, 15 years from now or 20 years from now, try to put a rail bed in, could you imagine the environmental impact, the challenges? I mean, it, it, just the, you know, these highways, you realize the, every time they do something, the MEPRA regulations, all the different things that they have to do, it would be so cost prohibitive that we could hurt ourselves. So if we do both, that would make the most sense to me. Um, and I, you know, I'm not sure where everybody is at it, but I think that that's, that's the greatest wisdom in that. And it opens up this unique access that you know, we here in Falmouth have started and you know, expanding it all the way down, hopefully at some point all the way down to, to the canal and down to Provincetown. The, uh, the rail beds have a significant impact on military, on business, on transportation, on evacuation, on uh, safety for individuals. The loss of that would be catastrophic, in my judgment. It would be depriving us of a vital transportation link that we possess in reserve for when we need it. Correct. And that's, and, 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 and I, so to that extent, I share your opinion on that. So it's, uh, you know, applaud and appreciate the desire to expand it and make it, you know, make it better. Uh, but I think we can do both, and I think it's wisdom to do both. Vinny, it's always fun having you uh, on, on camera with me and uh, listening to your views. We've talked about the Commonwealth and your perch on Beacon Hill. We know you're here all the time uh, in our community and, and throughout your district. Uh, and yet you have to be looking over your shoulder at Washington itself, inside the Beltway. Things are happening or not. Things are in, in motion or not. Things are in chaos or not. Uh, your, your view of any number of topics that are there, I want to give you an opportunity to bring out your broad brush and you can talk about immigration, you can talk about the DACA, you can talk about any topic at all, but you only have a couple of minutes to do it in. If, if I was to talk about the biggest concern I have, what I'm seeing in Washington right now, is the lack of dialogue between the parties. It is, it is not good for the country. I always talk about Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, both Republican, Democrat, powerful people in their, um, in their parties, and they would battle it out, and yet then they would come together and they would find consensus and do something that's good for the country. With no conversation between the parties, we will never solve the big problems that are going on. Social Security, Medicare, the rising uh, national debt. These are things that can be fixed, but they need to be fixed together so that no one says, ah, it was your fault, it was your fault. That's dangerous, and that's what's happening in Washington at a fever pitch that I've never seen before. The lack of decorum, the lack of conversation, the lack of bipartisanship is not good for this country and we are better together than we are apart and that's why it's the United States of America. I'm really, if, I, if that was one thing that I could say is that, you know, it's discouraging and it's, it's discouraging for a lot of people. In my experience, 
in now this my 19th year in, in, in politics, I have never seen people so um, polarized as they are today and angry, you know, calling up and yelling and screaming. And, and yet there's so much that we agree on and yet you just you're you're picking sides and i think that's it's it's not a good thing for the country and i i hope it will turn i don't know when senator thank you for your energy and continued work on our behalf jay thank you for having me on your show i always appreciate it always you've just been listening to senator dimacito this is senate spotlight i'm jay zavala i want to say thank you to deb rogers to jeff wyman to susan zavala for helping me put this program together Stay tuned for more great programming from FCTV and Go Pats.